it's always hard to hire specifically at our scale, right? With 2,000 people across 100 countries. But hiring globally gives you a bigger pool of people to hire great talent. Alex, I'm so excited to make this happen. I met you first like years ago when you were starting deals. So first, thank you so much for joining me today, my friend. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to doing this with you for a while. Oh, so have I. And I mean, what incredible numbers you posted the other day. I looked at them and I was like, holy shit. Um, but I want to go back a little bit. So take me back. Founding moment. When did you decide the deal was what you wanted to spend the next 10, 15 years of your life on? Yeah, I mean, you know, the quick background on myself and Shuo, and you should talk to her at some point, is we, you know, we're both international people. I grew up in France, she grew up in China, moved to the US, and I lived in Israel and a few other places. Uh, we met back at MIT and we kind of diverged. She went and built a company that eventually was acquired by iRobots and then Amazon. I went to start a PhD in the UK, actually. It was a great experience, uh, but, you know, it wasn't really for me. So I started building companies. And, you know, throughout my whole career, I kind of had the luxury to meet amazing people from all over the world, right? And clearly so that where you're from definitely impacts the type of oppor opportunities you have. Like, you know, you created your own opportunities, but if you would have been in the Bay Area, it would have maybe been a little easier even for you, right? So, yeah, I, and, and still, I still had access to computers because of my schooling in the UK. If I was at poorer countries and educated in poorer countries, I wouldn't have had that, so totally. For sure, sure. So the idea of, uh, you know, when we started our first companies, I, well, first I couldn't afford engineers in Israel because they're so bloody expensive, right? So I had to find amazing people in locations where I could actually uh, be able to pay the bills at the end of the month and, uh, you know, hired a few people in the Ukraine, in Serbia, in the UK. And actually, most of them are still at deal today, right? For the iterations of companies that we built together. But yeah, for me, it was kind of always obvious. Like, you know, the world is a very big place. It's all about working with the best people wherever they are, rather than being limited to a 30 miles radius. And that's really what deal is all about, right? Like helping you go global. I, I totally agree with you. I mentioned to you before the show, we have people in South Korea and Colombia and use deal for 20 VC. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do want to ask, you know, when you think about navigating the idea maze and choosing what you want to work on, I remember speaking to Tarek at Kalashi before the show about kind of very early um, uh, iterations, let's just say, of Deal's idea stage. He said, what advice would you give to founders on navigating the idea maze and choosing what idea to focus on? If you look at what we got into Y Combinator in 2019 with the idea we started, um, the concept was very similar, right? Like we wanted to help freelancers at the time get hired and paid by the best companies. And we thought the problem we were solving was around the trust, right, of two different parties being in two different countries. That ended up being wrong, right? Like the problem being more around the compliance of working with that person and not understanding their local compliance and all of this. So what I would say and what we're really good at, I think, with Truo is just trying things and, and doing it very fast, right? Like just executing on something, seeing if it works and then being very realistic with ourselves. Like it's not good enough. Let's just you know, not do it anymore. And actually, this is a trap that we almost fell in, right? Like when we were at YC, they have this thing where they do like group office hours and everybody presents like what they've been working on for the last two weeks. And like you're always enticed to say like, oh, we grew X or we did that and we did that. And everybody around you is doing the same thing to kind of like show off a little bit. Uh, and then you end up thinking, hey, I'm not doing too bad. But when you actually look at what you do, right? When you go from like one user to two user, right? Hundred percent growth, great. But nothing actually <laughs> happened. <laughs> also. Man, I've had so many investor updates, which are literally like, I was like, 200% growth. You're like, wow, we've made $12. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, you know, it's very rewarding as an entrepreneur, but at the same time, you need to think about it. Like you said, right? You're going to be working on that for the next five to 10 years. Like, is this what one you want to work on? Is this something you're truly passionate about? But more importantly, are you being true to yourself? Is this going to be really big? And if the answer is no, it's okay. Like sometimes it feels like everybody's looking at you, everybody like, checks everything you do, every lunch you do, but most of the time no one truly cares, right? And they forget the next hour or the day after, right? So you just... I said this to someone the other day. I said, yeah, you've got to remember, no one actually gives a shit about you. And it's not you, it's about you as well and me. Everyone's yeah, focused on their own lives. Siblings, you know, they care, but like, you know, the guys on Product Hunt or Twitter, they, they don't, right? And you can relearn like 10 times. No one will ever notice. Totally. Can I ask, Alex, we, we chatted before the show, we've chatted many times before. You're 29, I'm 26. Um, you know, obviously, Deal's a great success now uh, and on the path to being an incredible company. Did you always feel growing up that you would be successful? When I was younger, I had this inevitability of success. I always felt it. I didn't know how. <laughs> Luckily, I, it worked. But did you know? I mean, I, I don't think I would have been able to define what success was when I was younger, but uh, I knew that I wanted to build great products. I knew I wanted to build great things. Like I never really fitted the mold. Uh, 
whether it's like not making it through interviews or uh, not really, you know, being excited to work at any large companies. I knew I wanted to build, right? And I mean, luckily, I come from a family of entrepreneurs as well, so it kind of runs in my blood a little bit. So again, I don't know what success, I don't know how I would have defined success a couple, you know, while I was a bit younger, but uh, I knew I definitely wanted to do bigger things. Did you fit in at school? So the funny part is I actually skipped two classes when I was younger. Um, so I actually like got my international baccalaureate, right? Like the French baccalaureate yeah. at 18, not 18. <laughs> so I had a really great experience at school because I was always the baby of the class. I was always two years under and everyone around me felt like I was their responsibility. So I didn't fit in in the way that, you know, I couldn't go out with most of my friends because they were much older, but they really like made me feel like, uh, you know, their little brothers throughout, throughout school. I was in a boys school only, so that feeling was really, really great. Listen, you mentioned the speed of execution being so important that I spoke to so many people before the show who mentioned that being your kind of defining superpower. How do you think about the importance of speed of execution for you and for startups today, Alex? I mean, I think speed of execution is what defines a company, right? And and speed of growth is what makes startup. If you're not growing, you're dead, right? So, I mean, this is something we got very early on at the company, maybe even from YC, where we just always looked at our week-on-week, month-on-month growth, and it had to be like, really really good um so i mean speed of execution is the only way and it's on everything right like operations customer support customer success product building like we actually have a principle at deal called deal speed which a lot of people misunderstand for like you know when they're looking at our principles like oh you want to go fast and really fast no it's about doing things really well really fast right like if they some and i actually find that most of the successful people around me have that in their dna which is if there's something you can do right now just do it don't push it to tomorrow, right? Like act on it and move really fast. And that execution helps you through every lifetime of the company, right? Like when you're an early startup, <clears throat> that speed of execution enables you to understand, is this the right product? Is this the right company really fast, right? When you're serving your customers, the speed of execution, the turnaround time, the care and empathy is what makes you, you know, have a happy customer that comes back and start expanding, right? So I think this is really something that's very anchored in the deal DNA and in us. I've heard some founders talk about going slow to go fast. There are some things where you need to deliberately reduce the speed to ensure the highest quality. Is there anything that you think you should go slow on? It depends, right? Like uh, when it comes to sales, I don't think you should ever reduce the speed. I think you should always triple down. So that's something that's uh, to me very important. You know, the hard part about deal is uh, when you're dealing with global compliance and global compliance is really, really complicated, right? Like it's not just like setting up a nice UI and starting to like uh, enable you to, to hire some people. It's understanding how do you onboard that person? How do you do it compliantly? How do you terminate them? How does overtime works in, in France, right? Like where I'm from, which is one of the most complica- complicated country in the world. And when you do that, you got to do it very, very carefully. And that's why as we rolled out our products, as we rolled out our operational infrastructure you know, we always took the time to do it really, really well. And that's what gave us an edge. So that is kind of slow to go fast. But at the same time, when you've got that figured out, you got to move really fast too. Can I ask Alex, I'm with you on the speed and urgency, but other people don't have it. And I spend my life constantly fucked off that people don't run at the same speed. This is just like, a, the show's turned into me being super sweet as a kid to like just being angry, like grandpa in the corner. But people aren't fast enough. And I'm going, fuck. And so my point is, Little. how do you drive and instill this urgency and speed in teams? You know, what I like about Dill is really the mission of the company is to help hundreds of millions of people get to be hired by the best companies in the world, right? And like, if you think about it, regardless of your role at Dill, someone on the other side is waiting for you to get their money, to get their contract, to, be, to get their severance. Like that already drives a lot of like empathy and speed inside of our team, right? Because they think, what if it wasn't me? Right. What if it was me on the other side waiting for my payments and not being able to pay rent because like the infrastructure didn't work. Right. So that helps a lot. And the second thing is, I think it's the type of people you hire. Right. Like you should only hire people that are here and that are really hungry. Right. That really want to build. That want to be part of this. That are here for the right reasons. And you know, it's always hard to hire specifically at our scale. Right. With two thousand people across a hundred countries, but hiring globally gives you a bigger pool of people to hire great talent. I totally get you. Can I ask in terms of like you know, bluntly focus. There are so many things that you can choose to focus and spend time on. How do you determine where to focus attention and what's a distraction? The way I like to think about it is if this is not catching my attention, like think about like a process that's broken, right? That's getting customer escalations or some part of the sales funnel or rev operations that's not working. Like 
if it's not getting to me, it's most likely that the, the leadership in that department is doing really well and they know that I'm here if, uh, if they need anything. If things get to me, deal speed, right? Like we move really fast. We want to dive into it. I dive into it really, really in the details. Like, you know, even at that scale, I think I know most of the business operations really well, right? I'm able to dive into the details and say, we got to find a solution for that really, really fast. And I think that's really the, the key as you scale. You said there about like, if it gets to you, then, you know, something has really gone wrong. There's a lot of trust at one places within team leaders and managers. Do you start from a position of full trust and it's yours to be lost or like it's gained over time? Like you've got to prove it to me. Fully distributed company, no choice. We have to start with full trust and it's here to be lost. Uh, we do have very tight KPIs and tight outputs and we measure people and we have a tendency to be really tough. Like we keep the best and, uh, you know, the rest usually don't make it. Uh, but when you get that full trust and when you're able to execute, it's the best type of life, right? You can work from anywhere, you can do whatever you want and you're delivering something really great. So full trust, it's all yours to lose. What happens when you have someone who's okay, they're good, but they're not amazing, but they're actually in a role where you kind of need them and it's a pain in the ass to remove them. It's a pain in the ass to replace them. I'm, I'm literally using you as a big brother here. What do you do then where it's like they're good, but not great? I think... The one thing that would be the defining characteristic for me at that stage is how much do they care and how hard do they work? I would hire someone that works really hard over someone that's really smart any day of the week, right? So if you work really hard and if you care, you know, you, I will be there to help you scale. I'll be there to help you grow and we'll have the infrastructure for you. Uh, and if you have that, I'll, you know, stay with us for the rest of time, right? If you are like this, and you don't care and you don't work hard and you probably will find a better place somewhere else. I totally agree. When you decide to let someone go, it's a big decision, four big decisions. Do you have a framework for making them? When you think about deciding on a new product, like a move the needle decision, how do you approach those big fucking hard decisions? When I want to let go of someone first, I look at the country and understand how to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yes, but uh, look, I think yeah, letting go of someone, uh, you know, Hiring takes so much time, right? Like you don't want to do this unless you really made a mistake. So you really want to be careful, but you got to be very decisive. If someone's not working out, it's in their best interest and it's in your best interest to probably part ways. So, you know, those are very clean decisions usually. And actually the biggest mistakes I've, I've made is not fire fast enough a couple of people that really, I think I was doing them a disfavor, right? Like they were not doing something that they really enjoyed or they were not, they were out of their depth and I, I didn't realize it enough. So it was mainly my fault. I think when it comes down to decisions, it's super cliche, but this idea of like strong opinions, but weakly held, I think what we're really good at there is just logically think about what's happening in front of us and make a quick decision. And then if we're wrong, like one or two weeks in, quickly like change it and iterate through it. And you know, that has to be the mindset. I don't think anything is set. Uh, well, some of the decisions we make, like opening a hundred entities are set for life, but like, I don't <laughs> think anything is set for life, right? Like you can iterate really quickly and, I think usually as long as you've got a very, very strong focus on your customers, you understand what they want, you understand the need that you're doing here, you should be able to make the right decision as a founder. You said earlier, we're, we're totally jumping around, but I've had like four espressos in an hour, so fuck it. Speed of growth isn't actually everything. Like 100% compounding works well. Do you not, how do you think about actually like, it's not important to grow 100%, but continuously and sustainably grow 30%. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, 30% is great. That's what we did at Deal, right? Like for the first two years of the business, we grew 30% month on month. So I'm all for that. You know, I think specifically when you're building a business where, you know, we have lawyers, HR, payroll managers in every country, and there's like operations and automations that needs to be built. If you grow too fast, you break the business, right? Like this just the, the customer experience gets hurt, right? And, and in Spain from the fact that the operations are not able to scale that. So I think there's a very fine balance between like growing and uh, maintaining your operations and your scale and how you do that. Not to be misunderstood for like, it's okay not to grow, right? Like you always need to be growing, right? So funnily enough, most of the numbers you see, right? Like four to 57, which is what we did in 2020. Um, one, I think, yeah. And then uh, 57 to 300, to 295 is what we did in 2022. That's actually why we budgeted even a little more at the beginning of the year, right? So that was calculated growth. You're 29, mate. I don't find hiring comes naturally to me, honestly. It is really hard. What have been your biggest lessons on hiring and talent acquisition and determining whether someone has that hunger? I mean, oh, yeah. you, it's obvious. A lot of people, it's not obvious. I actually, 
interviewed the first, I think, north of 400, 500 first people at Dill. So um, spent a lot of time on that until I actually thought it was, I think it's a mistake. I should have kept picking that funnel, but until my team told me, you hear the bottleneck, you need to stop interviewing people. Uh, but I learned a lot through that, right? Because like that's thousands and thousands of interviews. The luxury I have, right, is that most of the people that got to me were people that were already cut out for the job, right? Like they had the right skills and they were the right people. So it was all about understanding are they the right people for the company and are they going to be able to work with, you know, the likes of Shua or myself who are pretty hard and, you know, hardworking but hard people to work with for sure. And um, what it taught me is to, you know, genuinely, even if someone has the right CV, if in your conversation you don't think they're the right DNA for the company, even if everybody tells you hire them, just don't, right? Like, that's the one thing that uh, I would say in your process, like make sure that if you think the person is not great or is not the right fit, even if they do everything on paper, just don't hire them. What's the, what's the right DNA? Like I, I always say to my mother, I go for walks with my mother and I talk about people and I say he wasn't or she wasn't a savage. A hundred percent agree. I think it's just, not in a bad way. It's just like the, that you need to be in the stage of your life. Then this is what you want to be doing, right? And this is what you want to be accomplishing. And uh, I think it, if not, you're just not going to enjoy your ride, right? You're not going to enjoy working with us because we are there, right? And if everybody's going at a thousand miles per hour and that's not the life th- the lifestyle you want, then you're just not going to have fun, right? So I think uh, being very honest with uh, the expectations you have, why are people coming to deal and joining your company and uh, how life is going to be? Again, like I love what I do, right? Like, so for me, this is the life I want. You got to make sure this is the life you're want, you want. And if it's not, it's totally okay, right? I, I totally agree. Um, and I think kind of you tell very early in that interview process. Class, you, you've scaled so fast. When we look at now over a thousand people in three years, when we think about like the blitz scaling strategy, two years? 2000. Oh, fuck. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, when you meet something, you're like, oh, I feel so insecure about my own life. Normally, no, I'm like, why? It's, you know, adding headcount is not what makes a company successful, if not the opposite. It's just you know, the complexity of what we do just uh, makes no, it. I, I know, but I tweeted before the show that you you printed more cash than central banks' quantitative easing policies, <laughs> which I thought was quite a good joke, actually. Uh, but anyway, I, I spoke to Gokul um, before the show, one of your angels, and he said, ask him. Just take me through the blitz scaling strategy. What was the key to such supercharged growth? Because Alex, like, just realistically, there are very few companies that can grow that quickly. What was the key? Uh, a few things. First, I think our product decisions were pretty on point. We started our product with helping companies hire contractors. We're the only one in the market. When we saw that there was an opportunity with helping people hire as employees, and we saw a couple of companies in the space, because we actually came in a little later on that. We executed really fast, right? Like from the product strategy, from the early sales into the hiring and the opening entities. And the same thing happened with Global Payroll, right? Like we started seeing companies thinking about opening their own entity, right? Like we're like, I we gotta get on that front, right? And now that we have all this solution, again, doing a pre pivotal moment and saying we're gonna be the full HR stack. Like so I think those product decisions to really grow with our customers and for them to see wow, okay, deal is growing with me, right? Like they're doing the right things and they're moving in the right direction. I can trust them. Right? Like when we started deal, the questions people were asking us is how do I know you're not gonna run with the salaries I'm paying out to my people, right? Like that's what we started with. How did you gain that trust with them? Because you were just a young startup, but like you didn't have brand. Well, um I, I think it's something you win over time, right? Like discussions, your face, like marketing, um, raising funds helps. Like I mean, I think if you looked at our numbers, we've always been pretty transparent as a company. Like you know, we talk about where we are, we talk about of course, you know, it's easier when you're growing, right, than than when you're not to talk about this, but like there is like intent into like sharing what we do, sharing how we want to help, sharing how we want to democratize like global hiring, remote work, so that people feel comfortable saying like, "Hey, you know, I can trust that company; they're really growing." So, can, tr- can I can I just ask on on the messaging side? I always find early it's really important to have a tight ICP, like to really be able to message consistently and accurately well to a small defined audience. Yours is such a horizontal. Hey, you want to hire people globally? Well, kind of the whole world's companies. How did you think about that early messaging and getting that ICP in the early days? Yeah, so this is a bit more complex where you have at least three stakeholders depending on the size of the company, right? Like HR, finance, and legal, right? All three of them care about one part of the solution and you got to harmonize them and you need to understand who in the company, you know, because different companies have different like strong leaders. So sometimes it'll be people, sometimes it'll be finance, right? Depending on the companies themselves. Usually end up being those two, to be honest. And legal is more here to to help them truly scale and make those decisions. Uh, then you, you basically tailor 
your pitch, right, to the person you have in front of you because you know what they care about, right? Like your CFO is going to care about savings, is going to care about automation. Your HR leader is going to care about people experience, right? And like different stack, different tools. So I think you got to, you know, in conversation, we're pretty high ACV, right? Like this is one of the reasons, you know, the company is doing well. is like we're selling something that's high value. So people are willing to pay more for it than your usual HR product, right? So when you have a higher ACV, you have much much deeper conversation with your ICVs and you're truly able to understand what do they truly care about to tailor it for them. Tell me, I heard about this go-to-market hack of having 50 customers on WhatsApp. What was that? I love having customers on WhatsApp. This is, uh, you know, I product reports into me and I'm, it's probably the place where I spend the most time. You know, again, Deal is four years old, right? Relatively young company. When you want to decide where you're going next, it's better to hear it first from your customers, right? And what better way to chat with them directly on, on WhatsApp, right? And I mean, I make great friends that whenever we're launching a new product, whenever we're thinking of something, I can just hit them up and say like, what do you think of that, right? And like that, nothing can beat that. Can I ask, how do you know what advice to take and what customer suggestions to take versus what not to? I have some people that are like, I want to hear more of the story of the guest. And then I have others who are like, fuck the intro. I just want to get to the strategy. And it's very subjective. So how do you know what to ingest and take in versus what to reject? Um, I think it's different type of feedback. If you're looking at feedback that's like, hey, your product is shit here and here and here, right? Like this is something that's very direct, right? You listen, you execute no matter what we tell you. When you're looking for like, where should I go next? What are the type of things I should go? I usually look for more validation, right? Like I have an hypothesis and I'm trying to understand out of the hundred people I'm going to talk to, how many people are going to take me there versus not. Um, So the feedback I think really matters on yeah, I mean, generally for me at this stage, it's less about the product. It's more about like, where should we go next, kind of. Matt, how much of your vision, <laughs> I've got so much energy today, it's weird. Uh, how much of your vision is predefined, like in your head, internal, versus is customer-led? Vision, I would say most of it is predefined. Product iterations, product directions, and the nitty-gritty of how to make it great. This is what customers are helping us figure out, as well as sequencing of what do we come out with first, right? Like the cool thing about HR is a lot of things are very adjacent to it. It's like we could probably sell any product to a certain amount of our user base, right? But understanding what is the right thing to focus on and when is where, you know, that's much more customer led. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about kind of market landscape and competition. Sure. It should be, should be interesting. You know, but 2,000 people in those four-year journey. The, the other question that I had is, what breaks first? When you think about scaling so fast, what are the first things to break? I mean, for us, it's always been, you know, about making sure it doesn't break. Like customer support, customer success, uh, operations. So whether it's like local operations, legal operations, or um, even fintech, right? Like payout infrastructure we're paying five plus billion dollar we've paid so far and I don't know how much of that is this year probably most of it um so that is the part that you need to be very careful you don't break as you scale right and this is always where you have the trade-off as you build your product like how much do I automate versus automate later right and how do I go about that and this is the part where we've been super super careful on and you know my CEO is a he's a savage like you said earlier and uh you know, he, he built a lot of the infrastructure at Revolut early on, and uh, they definitely teach people how to build strong processes and operations at that company. But Alex, good, good answer. You, career in politics, what broke first? I used to do support 2021, and there was a time where there was too many customers. I couldn't do it anymore. I needed to hire someone, and I had not planned fast enough to hire there. So uh, I struggled for it. Me and Shaw were doing support every day till like very late on different time zone to make sure that we get that. And, you know, that was misplanning for me. I mean, again, there's lots of things that break. It depends what department you want to focus on, right? Like when it comes to sales, invest in sales up so much earlier, right? Like we're paying the price of having a, well, now it's much, much, much better. But at the time we paid the price of having not a perfect sales force that was easy to use, right? So like there's tons of stuff that break. It's just a matter of focus. Talk to me, why invest in sales ops much earlier? And what was the lessons there? If you're sure you've got a form of product market fit, Revenue operations, sales operations is what's truly going to enable you to scale because your reps are more efficient, your close rate is better, you have a better understanding of what's going on, your SDRs are much more efficient, your customer success are much more efficient. And um, if you want to scale as fast as we do, like it's all about optimizing so that they can do their job and empowering them to do that. And you know, if you look at today, I think we have easily more than 200, 300 plus reps, right, on on in the sales organization. Like optimizing for them and making their life better is such a great investment for us. And uh, 
you know, as you, as you grow, you, you know, when it's your first time building a company at this scale, like you don't have as much insights and you know, thank God we brought some really great people to help us there. And, uh, you know, the, the bright side of this is like, now that we are like, they're making such an impact that we're significantly increasing, like improving everything on, on our sales organization. Can I ask with the consistent demands that you place on the company for growth and speed of growth, how significant a role is technical debt? Because you constantly want more, you constantly want speed, and it's easy to plaster over. Did technical debt become a problem at a time? No, uh, not really, actually. Like, I think we, we can do much better. Uh, and I think, like, we're always refactoring our architecture and thinking about different things. That Specifically, as you introduce new product, right? Like, if you think about deal and the lifetime of the company, we started with contractors, and then we did a blur of record, and then global payroll. And now we're actually coming back and saying, okay, we're going to add an HR layer under this that's going to be the base of the infrastructure, right? So you're coming back underneath and saying, okay, now you have someone on your HR platform and then they can be something else, right? Like an EOR, a contractor, whatever. Like, so, you know, on the architectural side, like that takes a lot of work. And, you know, very early on, maybe we didn't do as much like refactoring as we should have. But eventually, as you build a very stable product organization that's growing fast, but at the same time, very careful on how they release things. And maybe we still push to production every day, but are much more you know, diligence on how they do that and how they do sprint planning, then you just basically build up more and more refactoring on your side. And, you know, you always have some form of technical debt, but as long as it doesn't hurt customers and you can fix it over time, it's fine. What have been the biggest lessons that you've learned in running a team of this scale remotely? It's remotely as well. That's what's insane. I think we might be like one of the biggest, if not the biggest private company that's fully distributed, by the way. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, there's tons, right? Like um, you asked at the beginning about trust. Like I think this is the most important, right? Like my frame, I think remote works for us because my framework is I trust you. Let's execute together and let's make sure you're the right person. And that really works. And I don't think it will work any other way. I don't think if you don't have that mindset, you'll be able to to really build a, a distributed company at scale. Do you give people the room to set their own goals or do you micromanage? Because this is my challenge, which is like, unless I micromanage, they don't fucking run fast enough. At the very beginning, depending on the size of the company, I think you shape leaders and they shape you as well into like building a relationship where like they're able to run on their own. So if, for example, my head of product, Pierce, you know, at the very beginning, he came from a very different type of organization. And now, you know, he knows what I'm going to say before I even say it, right? So like, I kind of fully trust him on running that really well. Um, so I think it's a mix of both, right? Like when you're onboarding someone, like it's important to be there for them, specifically on like a remote base. As you grow and as you hire very, very strong people, I think, you know, you tend to be a little less micromanaging. Now, being in the details is very important, right? Like, you, first, you don't need to be in the details and annoy the people you work with. You can just understand the details and then stand, you know, say something when you have something to say and not just say it all the time. And that usually helps. Did COVID as like a, a general kind of like theme for two years make it easier for you to scale because little. everyone was acquiring talent remotely and it was the new normal? Or did it make it harder because it was more competitive, actually, and then everyone could hire remotely? Um, well, you know, we started a company in 2019, right? So right before COVID. So it's hard for me to tell you how different my life was because we were not hiring in 2019 versus 2020. But I think what we saw is that, you know, the war for talent, this mainly because a lot of companies were growing really fast, so they felt like they needed a lot of headcount to match that, that growth. Uh, went a little crazy, and the salaries that came out of that were a little insane. That did help on the sales side on our side, right? Because like people were starting to look outside of the Bay Area for hiring. Uh, so I don't have a really strong answer for that, but you know, COVID for us as a company um, did two things. One, it helped us acquire like larger enterprise customers that needed a solution much faster because their best engineers was relocating to Croatia and they didn't have an entity there. Uh, but it also like sets the tone, I think, for the whole world to look at global talent as a. I can probably do that. The final one on team and people. You said to me before that Silicon Valley won't be the epicenter of tech for much longer. There's this like revolt on Twitter where like everyone's coming back saying, oh, it's back with AI, baby. Um, uh, why won't Silicon Valley be the epicenter, my friend? I think Silicon Valley is a mindset, right? Like it's very, very strong people that are all over the world, right? I think I'm a pretty strong embodiment of like the values that Silicon Valley has. I think you have as well. And you're in the UK and I'm in Paris right now. So I think that's never going to go away. And I think this is kind of like the stepping stone of, you know, of our whole networks and the whole, this whole ecosystem. Saying that one location is like the center of everything here is, you know, with the state of the internet today and the accessibility and investors being willing to invest, you know, we raise most of our rounds actually, like without even meeting most of our investors, right? So like that shows that, you know, the valley has expanded into the world. And 
I lived in San Francisco for a bit, right? Like I understand the mindset of like, you're in a room, there's a lot of smart people, there's nothing to do at night, so everybody's working all the time. I get that. Yeah, that's a great way to build great companies. I totally agree with you. They also go to bed and have dinner so freaking early. It's incredible. I think it's uh, PM or something. I don't, you know, I'm from, I'm from Paris and Tel Aviv, right? Like you start going out at 9.30, 10, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you, uh, no one was also in the office until like 10 a.m. in Paris. It's bizarre. <laughs> um, I, I want to move away from team, though, more to the space itself, because the space, it bluntly is hotting up. And I spoke to one of your investors who said it's not a winner-take-all market, and you vehemently disagreed with them, apparently. Um, and, so they, any day. and so to tell me, it's not a winner-take-all market, Alex. Why am I wrong? Because we're going to make sure it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Is there is there a reason though why? Like, is there a structural reason why it's not? I think there can be a lot of great companies in this space. I think like every space, there's like one clear winner that's going to come out of this, right? And that's going to be significantly larger than others. That's how I kind of word it. Will you have, you know, a couple of 10 billion plus dollar companies built there? Sure. I think this is really another company that can be built, a generational company that can be built. And there's only going to be one of those. I mean this super nicely, man. You just said like a couple of $10 billion companies. There's not many $10 billion companies in the non-2021 inflated quantitative easy environment. Like, you know, Twilio is a $6 billion company. You sure there's going to be a couple of secondary companies that are worth $10 billion? HR payroll like, is such a complex infrastructure that is always specific needs into specific markets and companies that can be built. And every single company needs a product that's tailored for them or verticalized for something they need as well, right? So I do think there's... Maybe, okay, maybe you don't go to 10. $5 billion plus dollar companies, sure. Uh, and, you know, they don't need to be blitz scaling, right? They don't need to get to a billion they are in three years, right? Like those are companies that can be built over the next 15, 20 years and get to that revenue because they've built an amazing product in that time frame. That's what I mean. I, I totally get you. you. You mentioned that verticalization. Do you think SaaS is bundling rather than going to vertical point solutions? And how do you think about that? <laughs> I, I love this conversation because I think one of the beauty of dealing the way we've built it is the ability of bundling and unbundling the both together, right? Like if you go into your traditional solution, you come in and they like try to feed you everything, right? And they try to sell you everything, specifically in HR, right? Like you got to be on your RHRS to be able to buy the other products and that's how it works. When you look at deal, you can come, and this is how we've been able to go to enterprise as well, right? Like you come and you can you can hire one person in South Korea or in Japan, right? In a couple of minutes, if you're Nike or if you're Subway, like some of our customers, right? They're like, you don't need to buy the full HR solution, right? We plug and play with your, your SAP or your Workday. We are also then able to introduce you to the different products that we have, right? Like, and you start having that suite of product that you're buying over time and like getting into the account slowly and surely and showing them where the right people to partner with. And that idea of like being able to like bundle everything if they want to, but also being able to unbundle and do things we're very specialized in at the same time, I find that like super interesting. I have Parker Conrad on the show and he mentioned that, but also how bluntly when you own the stack and own multiple different products, all catered to by the same service provider, like what an enhanced product you can build because of the data that you have across the product suite. Like, how do you think about the increased product you can offer because you have multiple different points into the company? I think it's, it's good insight. I, I do think that there's some products that are much more complex to build than others where you need to spend a lot of time on and where a lot of companies are building heavily into that, you know, whether it's compliance, whether it's infrastructure, Building a lot of products that are six or seven out of 10 is a good Microsoft-like play, right? I think some of them needs to be nine and 10. And you know, I think Deal to some extent is doing part of that where we want to be able to consolidate all of this and enable our customers to really grow. Would I want to take on a, a Brex or a ramp? Probably not today, right? Like I think you really need to put the right care in order to build the right product there rather than build a product in a couple of weeks and pushing out to market. Would you want to take on Brex or ramp in five years time? I'd love to partner with them. You know, those are two two very close companies. I love them. So uh, probably not in that space. Ah, you're such a good politician. There's a, the politician's a tactic called the pivot, which is when someone says something and they make a nice little pivot to the yeah, side. Enrique, Karim, they're animals. They're savages. I want them on my side, not on the opposite side of the table. Oh, I know. I remember going for drinks with Enrique in London. He was like, I'll have a tea. And I was like drinking like a nutter at the time. I was like, you boring sod. And now I'm like, I don't drink. And I'm like, this guy is smart. <laughs> And it's important to be focused, right? Like my job is to help hundreds of millions of people get to work for the best companies and make sure that they do it completely in every single one of those countries. That's not something you launch in a couple of weeks. That's something that's taken us like years to get to because of how complex it is. And it's super important that, you know, we get that right. And 
you know, when you're dealing with labor laws that are changing every week, with taxes that are changing every week, right? Like with uh, in payment engine, like payroll engines that are different. Like you have startups like PayFit or Pento that are like literally building a pay- Augusto in one country because that's how hard it is, right? Like doing things right in this space is super important. So we want to be really focused on doing that and then adding the things that we find are a little easier to build, like the software, HR stack of like adding people uh, and all of this. Cass, Europe is not an easy place for compliance. A lot of Americans are like, ah, Europe, ah, Europe. Uh, yeah, I love uh, that. <laughs> like, is it like a, yeah, we can take Europe or is Europe actually as difficult and challenging as one would expect Europe to be. The last three months. And I can't wait for, you know, companies in this space that are coming smiling, thinking, oh, it's such a high ACV, we're going to have fun. Uh, like, in the last three months, thousands of people got laid off. They Most companies, apart from the one, you know, that are really in this space that know how it works, have no idea how to fire someone in the Netherlands on behalf of your, of your customers, right? Like, the rules to do that, we, you know, it's crazy, right? And again, the the easy part of any OR, the like at least one of those products, like people love to say, oh, that's an amazing product. The moat is not that strong. Sure, it's easy to spin up an entity and then get people unemployed on it and charge for that. But what happens when you go into Germany or France when you need specific licenses to do that? What happens when you start needing to do mass termination when in some countries you cannot terminate more than X people at one time, right? Like those are the things that are truly, truly hard that a lot of people in the US think, oh, this is going to be easy because it, it works like in my country, but... I mean, you know, that that's not it. No, my, my, I, I think the reason why I've been actually quite successful as an interviewer is I ask stupid questions that probably everyone else thinks. Um, in a world where everyone else is getting laid off, literally every day there's new layoffs, how does deal grow? Like, your business is predicated on hiring. Like, how do you grow if everyone's getting laid off? Yeah, I think it's a matter of two different things. One, consolidation of tools is super important and mm-hmm. having one solution that helps you grow into different workforce mode, whether it's like contractors where we help you do that completely, opening your own entity so that you set all the costs and having everything in one platform, that's super appealing for our customers. Second is, and I mean, I'm getting calls by some of the biggest HROs, CHROs and uh, CPOs of the market, right? Like people understand that paying 500K and burning, you know, tens of millions of dollars per month is not as sustainable anymore. And it's not growth at all costs now. It's about profitability and a great way to achieve that because the market hasn't co- like come down in some of the key markets, right? Is to hire internationally, right? So like building a strategy that helps you navigate the different employment mode, navigate the different countries to get the best talent, I believe is going to be one of the big play of 2023. I mean, I'm super biased, but I believe that it's going to be one of them. Do you think that cost focus will drive a bundling? And what I mean by that is traditionally in bundling, you obviously have kind of better economics. You get the whole suite for $49.99 versus point solutions, which are kind of $19.99 each, and then you end up paying $100. Do you think, and they might be nine out of 10 products, and these are seven out of 10 products. But do you think that actually that cost for efficiency on savings will drive bundling? 100%, because the HR leader who we love is not going to have as much decision power here and the CFO is going to, right? So 100%. So if you combine the idea of bundling the hard things, right? Like global payroll, EOR, contractors completely, immigration services, right? All of the things we do into one product, you know, let's say if tomorrow were to release a performance management tool, it's maybe not going to be the best in the market straight away, right? Hopefully over time it will be. But, right, like your CFO is going to be happy to have a five or six out of 10, even not even seven, right? Like five or six out of 10. Because it's going to cost, cost, and bundle everything. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you've recently made some acquisitions, speaking of kind of like product expansions. Talk to me about how you think about making acquisitions, because I'm just intrigued. Why do you acquire versus build internally? What's that decision making? Yeah, I think a few things. One, it's amazing to other grand entrepreneurs that are very passionate about what they're solving and, and telling them, hey, like, first, here's 15,000 customers, right, from all different segments that we can sell into your product and help us get better. Second, usually what the companies we acquire are doing is very hard, right? So we acquired, for example, LegalPad that did U.S. immigration. They actually did my own O-1 visa. That's right. very, very specialized. It's very hard to do. And taking this immigration product now to 26 different countries, like we can help you hire someone under a visa and get them the visa in 26 different countries. Like this is really, really, really hard. And that expertise is super valuable for us. Or if you look at Pay Group, which was like a bit of a crazy acquisition because they were a public company in Australia, they do payroll in like all they pack themselves like good luck running payroll in like china india japan yourself right like this is where we went from hey we're working with local people that help us run payroll on our own entities 
to deploying our global payroll product and saying, bringing everything in-house. And those guys are freaking amazing at it. And we're here for it. They gave you a visa? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I mean, uh, all one visa, not only a visa. Oh, not just a visa. You're a special person. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me, that's really hard, though. Like, you acquire, you know, the, this Aussie company that's public, and then you just integrate them in steel. Like, how did you do the integration? And, and, and Alex, how did you know what to do? It's hard. We don't know how to do it as well as we want to. Uh, luckily for us, my CFO, who actually is also my father, that makes it quite interesting dynamic-wise, uh, actually, his first company, who we took public as a CEO, did about 50 plus m to grow. Um, so they didn't grow as much organically. They were a service business, so they did a lot of m So that's actually something he's really, really good at. Um, so that makes the cost of acquiring a lot cheaper, but so the time in the negotiation a lot easier. Uh, and then when it comes to the people side, I mean, there's still a lot of work to do, but you know, KC, our head of people, is really amazing at that, putting a right plan together and executing on it. And you know, I think it takes time to do a proper integration, but uh, we're getting better. Tell me, your father, I didn't know that actually. How do you make it work with your dad? You know, we're very tight as a family. You know, uh, the way I was raised, we're very, very close. And um, I think we have very different skill sets, right? Like I'm much more aggressive, make decisions a lot faster and much more product and maybe a bit more Americanized in many ways, right? Where I understand the value a bit more because I studied in the US. Where it's much more traditional French, like CEO of a public company. One of the reasons we are a bit uh, um, positive now, right, since September, which was one of the big announcements we had, is that in January, he looked at the market and he said, uh-uh, hiring freeze everyone. You got to work on your workbooks and what you're doing. And I want us to be a bit that positive by the end of the year. And we we're like, okay. And it ended up being like one of the best decisions of the company, right? So I think we have a very, very different skill set, but at the same time, very complementary. And I think there's a lot of like, mutual respects where he understands, you know, I'm also here to make my mistakes. So, you know, his favorite thing is like, you'll see in three months I was right or in six months I was right. And he's right most of the time, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> he's a very special person on this. He's very, very strong and I'm learning a lot from him. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think the trifecta of like finance people and uh, and Shuo, who is managing most of the sales, is really like working well together into into building deal today. Uh, that's fucking awesome. I did not know that. That's so cool. Um, listen, I want, I want to touch on... We spoke about your father. I want to touch on you and then a quick fire. You took secondaries out, my man. Uh -huh. um, it's always shrouded in secrecy, which I think is what drives so much of the cynicism towards them. I think if there's like transparency, like, how much did you take out? Uh, on my side, around 10, mainly to buy like an apartment and a few different things I wanted to do, like buying some presents for my father and my parents. But the cool part is that when we did that, um, Shu and I, we actually allowed all our early employees to do it as well if they wanted to. Got you. How did you decide that was the right amount, one, and how much early employees took secondaries? Uh, the right amount for us? Well, the place I wanted to buy cost X, and then I had a couple other things I wanted to get done. Um, so it was one, something we felt comfortable with, and second, getting to the amount that the guys that did the round wanted to get to. So they just go for those things at the same time. Because <laughs> the they're right. They want a certain amount of ownership or put a certain amount of money. And when you're at this stage, like, you know, that definitely is a part of that. How many people did secondaries on the employee side? Um, I can think of like 15. Uh, but again, you know, it was 10% uh, of what they had earned, right? So like, we don't want them to be checked out, right? But it was definitely like, in more, even some of them more than me in the amount side. So, uh, I think they were very happy and they were able to do a lot of great things and they're still key leaders at the company they're executing and got deal to where it is today. Mate, if you have a savage and you give them 10 million, they'll be even more of a savage. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's exactly what happened, right? Like some yeah. of the people that took money off the table, like they were able to buy the things that they needed to have like a really good life. And now they're like, well, you know, I'm good. Let's freaking go. And actually one of the things, you know, most of the smart investors I've worked with that work with founders and Frankly, it was not exactly my case. I wasn't as much in need as maybe some other founders, but like, I think smart investors understand I don't want the guys that are running the company to be worrying about, you know, yeah. the whole. And, and that's, I think it's important because when you have so many things to worry about, worrying about that as well is not useful when you can, you know, set a bit of your shares to someone that's interested in it and not take and have a peace of mind on that front. No, I totally agree with you. I, it's the most ineffective waste of like mind space for your team to have. Um, when you can solve it. Yeah. What advice would you have for founders when it comes to secondaries? Because a lot of them are getting killed. How do you how do you think about advice for founders? And well, I mean, I'm no one to judge what other people are doing. Um, I do think that, I mean, I think that crazy is over, but like taking secondary at like the series A, I don't think it's super smart. Um, <clears throat> taking it a bit later kind of 
I think makes a bit more sense. I mean, we have taken a little bit at our Series B and then a little bit more at our Series D. Um, I felt like this was the right amount and the way we kind of did it was very systematic where we work on like a little bit of secondary there and then on the, on the second one would be a, a refresh in the next round for our shares as we go. That's how we kind of think about it. Uh, so I think the right amount is what makes you comfortable depending on your situation. You know, I don't have a family. Uh, I just wanted to be able to have like a, a nice place I can live in and then, you know, put some money on the side so that I can diversify and uh, that has worked out really well. I don't know if taking a lot of secondary is super smart, but, uh, you know, I think in my case, I think it's going to be worth a lot more. So. so you angel invest with the proceeds. How did you decide how much to put aside? Did you decide that I'm going to put a million aside for angel investing? Uh, you know, I think most founders that take a little bit of secondaries, the first few months are very dumb with their angel investing and they just invest in everything that they see because their friends send it to them. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is the case like amongst most of my friends that did a bit of secondary. So like, I'm not the only one. <clears throat> but uh, did you, you know, do this? Uh, I, I st- no, so thankfully, I actually started investing very, very early on for fun before. So I have a bit of experience. And uh, I definitely invested in some companies because uh, it was my friend running it and maybe it wasn't the smartest decision. But uh, now I've become much more calm and much more, you know, I don't really have time to manage it anymore. So I rarely do enjoy investing in the last few months. Can I ask, what have been your biggest lessons from doing that investing, both for the fund and angel investing? How has it impacted how you run deal? One, I think a lot of, Funders, so I think we actually do send really great investor updates, and I think a lot of funders send very shitty investor updates. So super uh, shitty, yeah. So like that's something that I've realized where I actually can, I think I can tell whether a company is going to be successful by the investor updates I'm getting very early on. It's a strong statement, but I really think it. Well, what makes you think it's going to work early? Is it data clarity? Is it like the tone? Is it the I want you to tell me how I can help you? How is the company really progressing? At the same time, you have like people that send you very shitty updates where you're like, there's no data and you can't actually even help from the data you're getting, right? So like, I think there needs to be a middle ground. So a lot of founders are worried. I, I think it was Ryan Hoover that said this to me because he's another of your investors. He was like, ask him about data transparency because a lot of founders worry that, oh, I shared too much data and all these investors are going to forward it and share it. What do you advise founders on data transparency in your investor office? Everything you send is forwarded and read by all your competitors. Uh, and that's number one. <clears throat> number two... I mean, even my board deck somehow ended up into competitors' hands. So, uh, number two, um, that's bad. <laughs> um, I think it, what's important is like you can be secret on a couple like product launches and a couple of your metrics, like whatever you feel is important. But at the end of the day, it's the same way that you launch, right? Like no one actually cares. You're a one million dollar company. There's another company that's at five million AR. If you think like sending your investor update of what you achieved last month is going to be like what's going to change the game between the two of you, then you're probably wrong. Um, so giving the right data is super important. Like don't go and share all of the data that you think are critical for your business, but share the things that are actually going to be helpful and makes people excited about you. Like, you know, if you were fundraising like two, three months ahead, show that you're growing to get your things that are happening. If you need help with specific things or if you're very proud of something like, you know, people are proud that, that they've invested with you uh, and they're invested in you. So share the right data and help them help you. How often do you send updates? How often do you want to see them from founders in the early days? Like what do you, sure. and then one, and then two, if things aren't going well, how honest are you? I send investor updates every month until September of this year. I realized most people weren't helping anymore. So they, so I just stopped sending them and I'm just sending quarterly now, which is a, just it's less about help because when I need something I usually go and ask it to the person directly it's more about you know making sure that they have an idea of what's going on with the company and they don't forget us because they have so much things on their mind that you know it's totally something that I I would understand I think early on you need to send monthly updates Uh, and I would be transparent but smart in the way I write it transparent in a way that things are not going well say it say what you need but do not try to have your investors commiserate because they like what you're going to get out of them is they won't care anymore, which is not exactly the opposite of what you want, right? So like, don't overshare, but share the things that you truly are worried about and you feel they're going to be able to help. Sharing something that's sad just for the sake of it is not useful. Final one, then quick fire. Who's the single most helpful investor you've had? Well, I have a lot. Uh, it depends what you need to ask me for. So like, okay, let's say let's say something's really gone wrong. So just and you just need support. Your genuine first call, like mine, is a guy Mark Evans, who's an amazing man in London. 
Yeah, it's like, you know, I have, you know, I'm lucky enough, for example, Andreessen has a big enough position that I get to talk to Ben every month, right? I actually have a call with him right right after you, I think. So, uh, you know, he's super helpful in terms of like the big decisions we're making. Maybe you haven't heard of him, but like um, there's a guy called Anthony from a fund called Green Bay Ventures, right? Anthony like, Schiller. I freaking yeah. love Anthony. He's the type of guy where like, you know, he's the only person I actually trust. I can commiserate with when something actually goes wrong. So that's super helpful. Uh, so Anthony is a beast, right? Like I would... You know, I'm very lucky because he's very picky in terms of where he invests because he deeply like commits to the company. And I think, you know, he's become, uh, you know, a lot of my investors are great, but they're busy and this, like he's really become a friend. And uh, yeah, that's something, it's very, he's a very uh, important version for us. He is a savage. Um, okay, we're going to do a quick fire round, my friend. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sure. I'm scared of what my brain's going to come up with, but sure. Uh Okay, so what life balance do we live in an entitled generation? 100% entitled. Why? Because there's an age for everything. And it's fine if you value work-life balance. That's something important for you. That's great. I think when you're building your career and when there's a lot of things to do, you should work freaking hard because nothing's going to be a handout. What have you changed your mind on in the last 12 months? Work-life balance. Uh, I think there's a stage in your life where it's important for you to take a step back and decide where you put your time and being able to prioritize some of the things that are important. Uh, not saying I got to that stage, but I think there's a few things that I realized on that front where I needed to put a bit more thought into a bit more prioritization here and there. What's the most painful lesson that you've been through, but you're also pleased to have been through because of the lessons? We almost had very early on a showstopper on one of our key products because... One of the person I hired, I knew was the wrong hire. I let them continue for a couple of months too long. I should have uh, been a bit stronger and cut them. They had everything on paper, like big resume, big company is supposed to be really good. So I was like, you know, give them two, three months to figure it out. And, you know, the speed at which we were evolving at and we were iterating and like the big wall that was coming to us, if we weren't going to cut that person, it was a near miss for us, for sure. The boards really add value. Depends on the stage of the company. Depends how well the company is doing. If the company is doing really well, the board is here to be supportive and helps you get, you know, the bigger customers and maybe help you see what you don't see. But at the same time, if you're moving really, really fast, it's hard for people to just have a strong opinion on a company that they sit once a quarter in, right? Uh, if you're not doing as well, I think this is where your board has the most value because assuming they have your best interest at heart, which is not always the case, Thankfully, it is a deal. You know, I think they're able to navigate you. And uh, I think Ben said it a couple of times, uh, I don't think a company can be successful without their founders. So helping founders through that is super important. What would you most like to change about the world of venture? I still think people have a bit of that mindset of like uh, Silicon Valley companies are the best in the world and they're the only one that can be successful. I think it changed a little bit during COVID. And I think hopefully we're the living proof of that being changed. But, uh, you know, I still think there's a couple of funds that are a bit, they're not taking the risk approach of funding people that are really hungry from places where they could really build meaningful businesses. And uh, yeah, I hope that changes. Penultimate one, when you look at your existing angel portfolio, if you could put all of your money into one, which would you put it in? Well, at what stage? At the current valuation or the last valuation? <laughs> at the current valuation. I still think Kalshi and Tarek, you know, there's an episode with him, right? I still think he's got something amazing. And he's got a one in a lifetime company, but he still has to execute a lot before he gets there. I think maybe ideally at the valuation from before. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably Kalshi or Clickhouse. I don't know if you've heard of them. I did get the valuation from before as well, but Clickhouse led by Aaron Katz is a, he's a savage in every way. He's really, really good. You should probably talk to him. Uh, they are, I think they can build an iconic company that can properly compete with AWS. I love that I've added that. Um, a final one, my friend. Next five years for you. Fuck, it's 2028. Where are you then? Where's deal then? Are we public? Are we not public? What do you think? I think we'll see. It's hard to to tell. And I think going public is just a milestone in the journey, right? So like, uh, here's your politician answer. We'll see. We'll yeah, see. I was about to say. We'll, 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 see, we'll see where we go on that front. I think right now, unless, uh, you know, Microsoft or SAP, more Microsoft decides they want to get into HR. I don't see anyone being able to, to bring us in. But that, uh, I, you know, we're very excited to build um, deal into helping hundreds of millions of people, right? And that's uh, that's not the political answer. That's actually where we want to get to, right? And I think we have a very unique opportunity of uh, breaking down a bit of those uh, those borders where, you know, I think a lot of people won't have to completely change their life for jobs anymore. They'll be able to work for the best companies regardless of their, you know, where they were from, right? And uh, that's something I'm super excited about. Alex, I've absolutely loved this, man. You are such a star. Thank you so much. And you've been brilliant on the show. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, chat next year at some point. <laughs>